Hello and most welcome to 2006. This year, this statue was made by Faribors Masse. It's a synergetic statue called Tekutosh, situated in Portland, Oregon. Kalilundal just found this one. It has a nice sword to it. Once more the spiral. <laughs> Wherever we turn, we find the spirals. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Portland. <laughs> In Portland. Portland spiral. <laughs> Portland spiral. By Ed Carpenter, but a fitting name. Carpenter. Very fitting. So today we have the privilege of starting a new article. It's association what we spoke about earlier with David McNeil, gesture and language, embodied knowledge, one could call it too. And the article is bodily self-knowledge as a special form of perception by Hao Tang. We previously had one article from Hao Tang. So this will be the second one. A little quote to begin with. In philosophizing, one must descend into the primordial chaos and feel at home there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel at home there. <laughs> Introduction. We normally enjoy immediate knowledge of our body of the presence, position, and movement of our own limbs. This knowledge is extremely familiar, but also peculiar, because while the objects of this knowledge, our limbs, are like objects of the external senses in being material bodies. Material bodies. Material bodies. The mode of this knowledge is very different. It is knowledge from the first person angle or from within. From within. <laughs> from within. So there is a peculiar combination of materiality and interiority in this knowledge. In this knowledge. The kind of interiority here defines a kind of self-knowledge. Self-knowledge, come in echo, self-knowledge. Self-knowledge. <laughs> 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 
this kind of self-knowledge, the genuine kind, we might say, is demanding since one must not only know something about oneself, but also know it from within. From within, inside the Klein bottle, going out. From within. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge from within of one's own limbs or bodily self-knowledge is obviously important for understanding the peculiar relation between one's mind and body. And body, and body. This paper develops an understanding of this knowledge by pursuing a particular question. Is this knowledge a form of perception? Perception! 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 Is it proprioception? Is it kinesthesia? As Alexander would say. Many think it is. Treating it as a sixth sense analogous to the usual file. <laughs> Something is not on the ground that it is self-knowledge. I shall attempt a synthesis and argue for a middle view. This knowledge is a special form of perception. A special form of perception. It is a special form of perception precisely because it is at the same time also a form of self-knowledge which is incompatible with its being a sixth sense. Sixth sense! Yet, it is a special form of perception because this knowledge is essentially sensuous. Sensuous! Sensuous! In particular, it involves a special kind of perception of space that is enabled by a special class of sensations which I shall call vital dynamic sensations. 
Vital dynamic sensations. Our capacity for this knowledge has received various names, such as kinesthesia, proprioception, and body sense. Body sense, body sense. Body sense of the inside going to the outside, that line bodily and logic, exogenous, endogenous. <laughs> I shall favor proprioception. Proprioception. Proprioception echo. Where are you, my echo? Proprioception. Proprioception. I love you, proprioception. Ah, proprioception. Proprioception, as also mentioned by David Bohm. These names suggest or declare that proprioception is perceptual. But this is prejudicial because these names themselves need Justification. I shall use proprioception only for convenience without prejudice. Without prejudices. Without... <laughs> I shall use proprioception without prejudices. Prejudice. <laughs> Two. The Anscombe McDowell view and the sixth sense view. G.E.M. Anscombe claims that when we ordinarily know the presence, position, and movement of our limbs, we know it straight off without observation. In particular, Without that, suppose, suppose special kind of observation that is called inner observation or self-observation. <laughs> from Alexander and Bo and also Benjamin K. Bergen. This claim is made in the context of her investigation into practical knowledge. The knowledge that a man has of his intentional actions Intention, paragraph 28. Practical knowledge is related to, but also distinct from proprioceptive 
knowledge. I shall not discuss it in this paper. John McDowell follows Anscombe in proprioceptive knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it is non-observational or non-perceptual. But he goes further and gives arguments as to why it is non-perceptual. Why? 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 We will know the reasons. One argument McDowell gives is very general. Proprioception is non-perceptual because it is self-knowledge. Self-knowledge! It goes as follows. Perceptual knowledge is a species of receptive knowledge. Receptive knowledge. But self-knowledge is by nature not receptive. Because Receptive knowledge derives from the object of knowledge, which is typically distinct from the knowing subject. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In cases where the object and the subject of knowledge are not distinct, for not instance, not distinct, not distinct. <laughs> come in, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> As for instance, <laughs> 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 one sees one's own hand. <laughs> for instance, when one sees one's own hand, the object is known as other, not as one self. But, yet, but, it lies in the very nature of self-knowledge that the object of knowledge is oneself and is known as oneself. So self-knowledge is non-receptive 
and a fortiori non perceptual non perceptual non perceptual In concert with this general argument, McDowell also gives specific arguments for the same conclusion. These arguments turn inter alia on a particular thesis about spatial perception, which says that perception of spatial properties requires perception of secondary qualities. Secondary qualities, we know them well, we know them. <laughs> We know them well. <laughs> Together, this package of arguments by McDowell amounts to a powerful strengthening of Anscombe's original view. This view, as which I shall call the Anscombe McDowell view, has two features. Positively, it emphasizes that proprioception is a form of self knowledge. This means if we accept McDowell's arguments that it is non perceptual. Negatively, it downplays the role of sensation in proprioception. Sensation in proprioception. <laughs> <laughs> this undermines any claim that it is a form of perception. Now, many people hold an opposite view. Proprioception is a form of perception, analogous to the customary five external senses. They are five. Actually, it has been called the sixth sense. This view is often assumed without discussion. In particular, 
writers holding this view often show little concern with whether proprioception is a form of self-knowledge. And if it is, whether this is compatible with its being perceptual. Perceptual! <laughs> perceptual, my echo. Perceptual. 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 Rather, this view seems to be mainly based on the conviction that sensations play a crucial role in proprioception. Three, a middle view outlined I think both views contain important insights, but neither gets it quite right. We are the middle view in between, neither nor beyond the law of the excluded middle. We have both, maybe. Nobody knows. What is insightful about the Anscombe McDowell view is its insistence that proprioception is a form of self knowledge. Knowledge! <laughs> self knowledge! Self knowledge! <laughs> Great! <laughs> <laughs> the main shortcoming of this view is that in downplaying the role of sensations, it threatens to make proprioceptive knowledge anesthetic. Anesthetic? Anesthetic. Ouch. Ouch. Oh dear. Ouch. What should we do? Uh, my Lord. Your chest, Kelly. Laugh. <laughs> this role is rightly recognized as crucial by the sixth sense view. The main shortcoming of this latter view is that it often fails to appreciate the deep differences between proprioception and the external senses, which threatens to make the objects of proprioception like objects of the external senses that is threatens to make 
our body or limbs, alien to our selves. The left hemisphere, he in the kill Christ, the schizophrenic, oh dear, autism. A proper synthesis must preserve both the sensuous nature of proprioception and its interiority. It's being a form of self-knowledge, self-knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Self knowledge. Such a middle path is not and entirely untrodden 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 brian o'shaughnessy in his profound work on the notion of body image has provided materials essential for achieving such a Synthesis. 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 <laughs> A synthesis. This notion of a body image of a unique kind of mental map. Body map, maybe, like couples Blakesley, that relates one to one's body from within, enables us to say somewhat articulately articulately what we have known inarticulately since time immem immemorial since time immemorial <laughs> namely our proprioceptive sensations are given to us as located on a primordial inner landscape. One's own body as one relates it to it from within. And through this givenness, give one knowledge from within of the presence, position, and movement of one's limbs. I shall follow or Shaughnessy, call this primordial inner landscape once body space one's body space body space oh. Oh. the character of proprioceptive sensations inseparable 
inseparable. Let us now inquire into proprioceptive sensations. This is necessary because without some appeal to sensation, we have no right to claim any kind of perception, however special. Special, special, special. Special. <laughs> Especial, <laughs> Mr. Faulty. <laughs> Proprioceptive sensations have the peculiar character of being, in a sense, characterless. To bring this out, Consider a remark by Wittgenstein. We should like to say of the sensation of posture that it has no content. It is before content. Before Zen. consider, for example, the posture of having one's right elbow bent. The postural sensation can be described thus. I feel my right elbow is bent. Now by no content, Wittgenstein cannot mean that my right elbow is bent, has no content, since it clearly has a content. Rather, he must mean that the sensation lacks a particular sort of content. A plausible interpretation is there's no sensation of secondary quality. This point, whatever Wittgenstein himself thought, seems right. The notion of secondary qualities has attracted much controversy. To avoid complications, I shall adopt Anscombe's conception of secondary qualities, which is also accepted by McDowell. Her conception is contained in this passage. We can see three ranks of predicate that apply to substances. The substantial ones themselves, like alive, or Horse. <laughs> you can imitate when Eddie Murphy played a donkey or a horse. I don't remember in some movie. 
Uva, uva, gold. The predicates that are not substantial but are substance involving like malleable in powder form, awake. Predicates that are neither substantial nor substance involving. These are the secondary quality words together with such qualifications as go with them. And here I will make a stop. Stop! <laughs> 2006. Oh no, oh no, stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Last words, go with them. Or oh. Anscom, 9881. Just give okay. me a second. I will be stop. I'll start with Anscom here. And I like that one. I will do the side. Briefly saying. David Bohm saw proprioception to be the superposition and the second secondary qualities are then what is after the collapse, the things, the relations, different predicates. We can see three rank of predicate that apply to substances. The substantial ones themselves, like alive, horse, and gold. The predicates, like red, green, malleable. And the predicates that are neither substantial nor substance giving. So, proprioception in this case is neither outside nor inside, but one cannot say it is not, it is also both. This could be, proprioception could be the understanding of the superposition, so to speak, if we by understanding mean a more extended, almost preemptive understanding before everything becomes the static world, the unmalleable world. Go to page 72. 72, please. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my god and many paragraphs here that's actually the last one oh, made it a bit easier one argument McDowell starting with the first line gives is very general proprioception is non-perceptual because it is self-knowledge so proprioception is actual self-knowledge and that goes nicely hand in hand with Sergei Penrose that means that the self the consciousness is the actual collapse which results or is both of these things results and is be very careful it's a causative and temporal aspect that should be put to the side. Time actually comes later, as so does causal relations. But that is the self. The implicit knowledge is the proprioception. which comes before, before, in, in quotation marks, before everything else. 
It is the event. Later, you have secondary qualities like time and space and the objects, the predicates. Another thing I thought of while reading this on my bedside, actually, it was lulling me to sleep <laughs> quite nicely. That is, it is also very close to the right hemisphere taking in everything, the body and the outside. This is what the right hemisphere does. We know this, the matter with things, and the master and his emissary, the most, the biggest collection of evidence has shown that the right hemisphere do mostly at least two things at the same time. It takes in the inner and the outer. And this, I would say, is uh, between the one and the zero, that is proprioception. It's not definite. And this is why Wittgenstein would say that later down here we say, but self-knowledge is by nature not receptive. It's not receptive. It doesn't take in something outside us only. And we don't have in the ordinary sense and knowing subject here of an object outside. So it's in the region of being non-perceptual and non-receptive. And we have a hint here from Wittgenstein. Jump already to page 74. <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful little quote from RPP we should like to say of the sensation of posture that it has no content why in my view it is because it is before the full content before the cleft between subject and object. It is in the Klein bottle without volume, this beautiful photo that Kalle found the other day. Oh, I like it. It has volumetric, but they all amount to zero. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. And that shows it doesn't have a content in the ordinary sense but it's still oh you found it fantastic that should be saved calibrated klein bottles <laughs> <laughs> Posted probably as a joke, I don't know. Or is it graduated with calibration nines? Well, this is before content. Do you get it? This is before content. And we also have a beautiful, uh, if we can keep to the climb bottle. We also have a beautiful depiction of the Möbius strip bringing the inside together with the outside in the most fantastic way. This is no content or before content. And this is why also it is enormously important with proprioception. It sort of is the one ring that decides all the other rings. It is the conscious control of the individual, as Alexander would have it, primary control. <laughs> it decides our living standard. 
um, how we work, how we function. Caleb, please join. More than welcome to join. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Namely, his interpretation that it's consciousness that makes the superposition collapse. Did I understand correctly? <clears throat> Yeah, 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 and even so more. this is a uh, Penrose position, yes. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. like consciousness. It what is the it's the same as the collapse, even. But yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, you could I also say. Agree sorry, and disagree. Sorry, you you could also say that. Uh, <laughs> I I agree and disagree. Mm. Um, let comp let's compare with other body parts. Mm. Uh, the famous neurologist wholeness with the W within parentheses. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah okay, one. so the point is here: the ear uh, makes perhaps the first superposition to collapse, or mm. rather, mm. it's still when you use your ears, you have it in superposition. It's both. It could be both with W and without W, whole or wholeness, or rather whole. Uh, so when you use your ears, it's, it's still in um, superposition. The superposition has not yet collapsed. Oh yeah, definitely. So it, uh, and we would not say that uh, ears doesn't have anything to do with consciousness. Of course they have. Yes, yes. So I would not say that um, collapse of uh, superposition is equals consciousness because um, perhaps there are two moments uh, in, the super, uh, in consciousness or mm. in the collapse. One is that when you hear whole, okay, then you, mm -hmm, we have then a superposition, but I'm, my consciousness is still present. My consciousness is, is still present. But when I use my eyes uh, to check, is it whole with W or without W, then the superposition collapses. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so sure. I say, yeah, yeah, why not? It's, also it's a fine tuning. <laughs> it's mine is my one fine tuning of Penrose's argument, so to say. Yeah, yeah, I like it. There's also another aspect that comes up there. Mm. Uh, a lot of the ear is actually proprioception as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The inside, where you have this uh, climb bottle like uh, shell, mm -hmm. where the balance system is located, and also where you would find the uh, leveling system, the acceleration system. So the air is deeply connected to proprioception. Mm -hmm. No, no, I like yes, I like your specification. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now let's go to the hand. Uh, we have the Morse paradox here. No, it's not mentioned here, but it's related to uh, Morse paradox. And Morse paradox. <laughs> um, so the question is. Um, uh, let me see the example with the hand. And no, this is uh, here's one hand. Uh, <clears throat> here is one hand is an epistemologic argument created by Moore in reaction against philosophical skepticism and in support of common sense. And um, here's one hand, and here's another. Mm. There are at least two external objects in the world, therefore, an external world. Exists. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> yes, so it's uh, rather stupid or even banal. Uh, we know that the example is like Cartesian, as you feel. Yeah, like, uh, it's, it's a bit that way. Yeah. Uh, Descartes, we know it exists. <laughs> but it's still great but, in a way. <laughs> I still like it. Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> also like this, hmm, Descartes, here is one hand, here is another. We have at least two external wo- objects in the world, therefore an external world exists. <laughs> <laughs> a full, uh, uh, se- a full sake pr- uh, proof. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, well, how do you say full proof sake uh, proof? Uh, full, s- uh, how, how you would you say full sake proof? A waterproof. Waterproof, not full sake. Uh, waterproof. No, water, waterproof. <laughs> but it was great. Thank you for that one. It made me laugh. <laughs> I, I don't feel uh, there's no superiority in, in my case against G more, but it's, it's a bit funny actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should also <laughs> I should also say that uh, Penrose and Hamrose is pointed to some. I don't know what to call it here. I, I have just started reading uh, Penrose Hamrose. Uh, there is some pre-consciousness, is some more expanded, non-conceptual consciousness that could be in the superposition that goes even more in your uh, refinement there, Kalle. So you are definitely, definitely the right uh, track. Yes, it's, the year, in my view, would be a kind of pre-consciousness. So. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, I, I really like that. I'm terribly sorry, but I need to... Uh, yes, end this. Okay, that's not a problem. Thank you very much, Kalle. Uh, really fun, and thank you very much for... <laughs> that's even better. We have here two bottles, therefore, <laughs> text and word exists. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Kalle Lundahl. Thank you, everyone, for coming in. Have a beautiful morning, day or afternoon. Do remember to take everything with a laugh. Bye-bye.